guys, it's Stephanie. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is part two uh, of the uh, kind of series I'm doing on Luke Skywalker, the basis of his character found in myth, in his histor history, legend, uh, and Joseph Campbell and George Lucas's vision for him, and where Disney got it wrong. Um, so yesterday we talked about uh, Luke as a young kid first stepping out on his quest. The Herald, the, the damsel in distress, the Heralds, R2D2 and C3PO, the mentor, the old, the old wise man, the wizard, uh, Obi Wan, and uh, the hero partners, uh, Chewbacca and Han Solo. So. Let's get into rescuing Leia, blowing up the Death Star, and if there's still enough time, I'll try to get through all of the Empire Strikes Back. So get ready, get prepared, this is gonna be fun. Okay, page 47 of Star Wars and uh, classic mythology, Star Wars, The Magic of Myth. Um, let's talk about the labyrinth and the rescue of the princess. First off, when they get dragged into the Millennium Falcon, it's sort of like being dragged into Labyrinth. Let me explain how. When the heroes come out of hyperspace to approach Alderaan, they discover that the planet has been destroyed by a giant Imperial space station, the Death Star. Once the Death Star has pulled the Millennium Falcon into its innards, the heroes find themselves in a labyrinth, a maze of passages, rooms, dead ends, bottomless trenches. Each has a different goal. For Obi-Wan is to free the ship, for Han and Luke, is, it is to rescue the princess and then make their escape. Classical mythology, the labyrinth, has always represented a difficult journey into the unknown. It is really a metaphor for our experience of life, which awesome see, off, often seems, while we are in the midst of it, to be a twisting, winding road, with no sense of to its digressions. Only at the end, if we're lucky, does a pattern appear that seems to have been in place all along. It is interesting to note that George Lucas created a maze-like environment in THX 1138 as well. In fact, when he first conceived that film as a student production, the first part of its title was The Labyrinth. In Star Wars, the Death Star's labyrinth forces the heroes to split up in order to accomplish their goal. The, the traditional triangle in ancient hero stories consists of hero, monster, woman, in which a hero must overcome a monster in order to rescue a maiden. Leia, taken captive by the Dark Knight, Darth Vader, is now guarded by the dragon of the Death Star. As it, as it suitable, as it's, as it's suitable for a 20th century story, the dragon is a high-tech monster, but it can still breathe fire and destroy everything in its path. Like medieval knights, the heroes will don armor, stealing it from stormtroopers they overcome along the way, and then make their way through the maze-like passages, passageways and finally be trapped in the belly of the beast before their job is done. As they set out, however, Han does not act like a chivalrous knight. Luke is only be able to persuade him to rescue the princess by offering a large reward. Now, if you remember what Luke said to Han, you could earn more wealth than you could ever imagine. That, in and of itself, is a line that takes on new meaning throughout the trilogy. Uh, I mentioned this in the uh, video I did about Han and Leia, and Luke means money, but the irony is, is that rescuing in rescuing Leia, Han discovers something more profound than the easy cash he's looking for, the reward he the material reward he, he needs to pay off Java. He discovers something he didn't expect he, he wanted to find. Love, companionship, this beautiful woman who sees through his scoundrel facade. And that is the reward Han really earns. And that is very profound when you look at through the whole rest of the series, you'll always come, when you think about Han and Leia, come back to what Luke says to him about finding Leia. And I want you all to keep that and remember that. Luke's first meet, meeting with Leia is something of a satire on the classic story of Sleeping Beauty. 
It's true that Leia is asleep, that she has been entrapped by an evil power in the midst of a well-defended fortress, and that her knight has fought her way to her side to... This is page 50. To rescue her. But there will be no magic kiss for this duo. Instead, Leia wakes to the sound of Luke entering her stall, or her, her cell door, and immediately asks, Aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? Leia may be in trouble, but she is certainly no helpless victim. Lucas was clear on this. I wanted a princess, but I did not want her to be a passive damsel in distress. Now, we've already gone through page 50. We can also look at Leia in the terms of Jungian, Jungian, Jungian ar archetypes. Also, that she is the woman in white. Uh, she is the classic known, the classic do domina to both Luke and Han, in a way. And let, let me see if I can go further into this. The Jungian archetypes. Vader is the perfect shadow figure. He is uh, powerful and ruthless, representing the forces of e evil in his all-black mask, battle armor, and robes. Brought to him is brought to him at his first appearance is a woman in white, his angelic opposite in every respect. Small and feminine, she wears a simple white robe and embodies the forces of good. Leia Organa is a leader of the living organic re rebellion against a me me mechanistic sterile system. Young calls such a figure anima, the anima. It personifies the feminine aspects of the masculine psyche, and it also and it often shows up just behind, behind the shadow. The anima can take on a number of shapes or forms, as does Leia on her jersey, journey through the trilogy. But, so let's talk more about Luke. The heroes have found a power too strong for their current abilities and skills to overcome. So they have literally been swallowed up by the very bowels. The Death Star sucked them in and gulped them down, and the walls of the garbage mass... All right, now we're back in the garbage mass because um, I really, really don't want to go th through too much of this because it takes too long. Um, so they're in the garbage mas masher. Entering into the maze of caves in the Death Star, the heroes have traveled down into its body and are, and are in its very belly, surrounded by water. We can even think of this as a return to the womb. And we can take the analogy even further. The walls of the room begin to close in on its occupants, just before their release through a small door, rather like the contractions that push a baby out into the world. So on the one hand, the experience is that of being consumed by the Death Star. On the other hand, this is an ordeal of initiation and rebirth. It may even be both. In the Egyptian mythology, this consumption and birth motifs are combined. Nut, goddess of the heavens, swallows the sun every night. It travels through her body and is reborn each morning. Star Wars heroes too will survive this ordeal and emerge and emerge transformed. So here we have the maze motif, uh, the most famous story of the maze in uh, classic myth mythology is Theseus and the Minotaur. Theseus is able to tread that maze safely because Princess Ari 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 Ariadne has has given him a ball of twine and winding it as he travels towards the monster at the center of the labyrinth. Theseus ensures that he is not crossing or retracing his steps on the way in, and he can follow the twine on the way out. Lucas is equivalent of the thread, also given to him inadvertently by the princess. The droids, R2-D2 and C-3PO, help Luke out the Death Star maze through the magic charm of the comlink. On the hero's journey, the trip through the maze represents a passage through the confusing and conflicting pathways of the mind in order to reach the center of one's being. Uh, center of one's being. There, the seeker can discover some essential truth about his or her own nature. In this way, the journey through the maze of the Death Star acts the first level of initi initiation for the Star Wars heroes as a group emerges from the dirty ooze of the garbage ma masher as though reborn. They begin to behave differently and come together as a hero team. The formerly self-serving Han Solo risks his own life chasing stormtroopers down a hallway so that the others can get away, and the faithful Chewbacca follows him. 
Luke, meanwhile, swings Leia across the precipice in the best action adventure style, his magical transformation from hapless adolescent to competent adult is underway. Losing the guide. In many myths and fairy tales, the hero slays a monster in the labyrinth. In this case, the monster, Vader, slays one of the heroes, Ben Kenobi. While the rest of the group is rescuing the princess, Ben Kenobi has disengaged the tractor beam that holds the Millennium Falcon hostage. But on his way back to the hangar, he encounters Darth Vader. The challenge to single combat represented the height of medieval chivalry, especially when engaged in the aid of a princess. In the Arthurian cycle, Sir Gareth fights the Red Knight to rescue the Lady of Leoness. Now Ben fights the Black Knight for the safety of Princess Leia. In classic structure, the hero's journey, the guy can only bring the hero so far, and Ben has now fulfilled his functions. He has ferried Luke across the pre preliminary threshold, given him the magic talisman, introduced him to the for ways of the Force, found him a pair of hero partners and protectors, brought him to the princess, and enabled his escape. Luke, is as, part of, as part of his growth, must let go of his mentor, just as Arthur has to become independent of Merlin, once he grows to manhood. And so Ben gives Luke a smile and a salute before letting Vader cut him down. Yet Luke will soon find that this guide has been incorporated into his own psyche and will return to him in spirit form to help him out when needed. Hero Deeds and Dragon Slayers, page 57. Having su successfully passed this first stage of their initiation, the heroes are ready for a more direct confrontation. It is time for them to prove themselves through daring deeds. At the Rebel base, they plan the attack on the Death Star, and Luke joins the fighter pilots of the Rebellion, setting aside his useful identity and pledging his life to a higher cause. With the rest of the squadron, he flies off to slay the dragon. In myths and fairy tales, dragons guard treasure or maidens, yet they can use neither. Symbolically, this means that they hold, but that they hold the riches and creativity of life in bondage. While wrecking senseless destruction, the hero's force is always equal to that of the dragon. Otherwise, he would not have the power to slay the beast. But his power is of a very different sort. And his use of this force, for right, not might, is what makes him a hero. In Star Wars, the Death Star is the dragon. Luke and Han had liber have liberated the princess from its clutches. Now they must liberate the galaxy from the menace that holds it hostage. In many a way, this combat between rebels and the Empire is reminiscent of the fight between David and Goliath. Rebels have nothing to match the mighty firepower of the space station. Their only hope is to drop a proton torpedo into a small target, the thermal exhaust port. And like David launching a small stone at the mighty giant. But it is not the size of the missile that will determine the outcome. Rather, it is the knowledge of exactly where to cast that cast it that counts. Similarly, only the small X-Wing fighters can penetrate the station's defenses, and success depends on the accuracy with which they, they can hit their t tiny target. In this trial, the climax of the first film, the hero's mettle will be tested. Have they learned what they needed to learn and during the initi initiation through which they have just passed? Han at first appears unredeemed. He accepts a reward for the rescue of the princess and then leaves before the battle begins, unwilling to sacrifice himself for the cause he has not yet joined. But just as Vader is about to destroy Luke in his final attack run, Han returns to save his friend and partner. The first stage of Han Solo's transformation is complete. He has transcended his selfishness and now acts as part of the team. As Joseph Campbell expressed it, Solo is a very practical guy, at least as he thought of himself, a materialist. But is, he was a compassionate human being at the same time and didn't know it. The adventure evoked a quality in his character he didn't know he possessed. As Luke charges down the trench of the Death Star, the disembodied voice of Ben Kenobi advises him to use the Force Luke let go. Ben, the master of secret ways and potent words, is part of Luke now. Luke's new powers triumph when he successfully com completes his bombing run without the use of the targeting computer and the Death Star explodes. Luke has become the Dragon Slayer. When Siegfried slays the dragon Fafner, he gains its gold, and by drinking its blood, its wisdom. As Star Wars ends, Han and Luke are rewarded for their valiant deeds with respected positions in the Rebel Alliance, and they have each discovered a new part of themselves. The heroes will find, however, that victory comes at a price, and they will eventually have to pay with their own blood. 
Descending, then, marks just the beginning of the next stage of initiation and more adventures on the roads of trials. So, where did Disney go wrong? Well, first off, there's no heroic journey for, for Rey. She is, at least in The Last Jedi, she does not have any sort of character arc at all. Whereas Luke had a character arc throughout the first trilogy and then throughout each movie. From callow, naive youth on Tatooine uh, to a uh, hero, uh, still very young, still very naive, but uh, Dragon Slayer. And the lack of knowledge of what Star Wars is about and what the, the, the mythology behind it at Lucasfilm right now is appalling. And one would think that Disney, with its uh, fairy tales, uh, that they've animated like Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, uh, Snow White, uh, you name it, that they would understand the significance of the symbolism in Star Wars, and yet they don't. Uh, it is, to me, breathtaking how far they've dropped the ball uh, trying to, to do something with a timeless tale that now when I look at it, even in this even in this book, and it's not that long of a book, but it's so full of it's about two hundred and fifteen pages. Uh, Star Wars: The Magic of Myth. Um, it's chock full of information that should have been should have been accessed by the story group, and yet was not. This is where Star Wars is faltering bad. They got Luke wrong right off the bat. And this little series that I'm doing about Luke Skywalker now, and actually about literally about every hero in the saga, because Luke touches every one of them, is trying to show where Disney and Lucasfilm under Kathleen Kennedy really, really messed up. And, and kind of give a basis to why some of the fans were knowledgeable in George Lucas's vision and what he wanted to accomplish are really upset. So this is Steph. Have a great afternoon. I will do uh, part three, The Empire Strikes Back, tomorrow.